Welcome to one of the workshops for our financial wellness month. Today we have Tracy Wilder from Utah Retirement Systems to talk about financial wellness basics. Tracy has been a retirement planning advisor with URS for the last six years, and he has worked in the financial services industry for about 10 years. So I'm going to turn the time over to you, Tracy, and tell a little bit about yourself. All right. Thank you, Sadie. Well, uh, hi, everybody. Thanks so much for uh, joining me this afternoon. I really appreciate uh, being invited to speak with you today on um, a topic which I think is really important and is and people are starting to rec recognize it uh, as being very important. Uh, I was telling Sadie um, that we actually started a financial wellness program uh, about two years ago and are excited to be able to get in front of people, give you an introduction to what fin financial wellness is, and then tell you more about the program uh, or the uh, the uh, service so that uh, you can take advantage of it uh, if you'd like. So what is financial wellness? Well, these are, this is two definitions. The first uh, is effectively managing your economic life. And the second is the process of learning how to successfully manage your financial expenses. Uh, as these definitions, uh, imply it's a process and it's a learning process. Um, and just like any other learning process, it's going to, it requires effort on your part, not only to learn it, but also to apply the principles that you learn. Um, financial stress um, takes, is a serious, takes a serious toll on people's health. Uh, not only their physical, but also their emotional and mental health. And this chart shows uh, the results of uh, some surveys done on this. And you can see that, uh, you can see how it talks about different health issues, whether it's uh, not sleeping well or overeating or substance abuse. But uh, I thought it was interesting that accidents uh, are increased due to stress. And of course, that's uh, because we're distracted and our minds are, aren't concentrating, uh, I'm sure among other things. Then of course, um, prolonged periods of stress can increase or exacerbate uh, anxiety and depression. And then I'm sure you're all aware of the studies that show that probably the biggest issue leading to uh, divorce or breakups um, deal with finances or issues with finances. Um, and so this is a real problem and it's, it's something that uh, is easy enough to understand, but will take effort to apply. All right, so basic financial wellness includes three areas. The first is a spending plan. Now, Spending plan is a good word or a kinder way to say budget. Nobody likes to think, nobody likes to hear the word budget because the word budget implies that you're unable to spend what you want. Well, so they've decided to use spending plan. And spending plan is broader than budget. And we'll talk uh, more about that in a minute. The second area of financial wellness is debt. Uh, recognizing the differences between good and bad debt, what makes debt good, what makes debt bad, uh, and then making wise decisions with respect to good debt, and then avoiding bad debt altogether. And then finally, the last area is emergency savings. This is your ability to, or a capacity to absorb a financial shock, whether it's something small like an unexpected repair on a car or at home, or whether it's something larger like uh, losing a job or being out of work due to health or an accident. All right, so let's dive into spending plan. Uh, so these are, the, these are basically what's included uh, in the process. First off, you need to analyze your incoming and outgoing money. 
one of the things I've learned uh, in this process is that surprisingly, a lot of people aren't aware of how much income or how much money is coming in. And more surprisingly, they don't or aren't aware of where their money is going. Um, I'm surprised I've, I've seen advertisements on TV for uh, apps that help people recognize uh, monthly payments for services they're no longer using, whether it's a gym or some kind of streaming service. Uh, and I'm surprised, I'm surprised by that. I'm surprised that anybody would need some kind of a, a system or software to tell them that they have money going out every month that that shouldn't shouldn't be happening. So that's the next step, right? You've got to know what bills you have. You need to know when they're due. Well, you need to know when they're due so that you can get them paid on time and so you can avoid late charges. Then, of course, your spending includes essential needs, you know, the food, shelter, clothing, transportation. Um, of course, those are our priorities. And then last, uh, it's important to save us a modest amount for something you can look forward to, whether that's going out to eat in the movies once a week or saving for a vacation or, or something else that's important to you. Uh, maybe it's buying a home. So here's an example of a simple spending plan. You simply have to first identify the income coming in. And so uh, you, it's helpful to understand the gross income that's coming as, as well as the net income. And net income is the income that actually hits your bank account after all of your uh, pre-tax deductions are, are um, taken from your paycheck. So whether you're paying for insurance, of course, your federal and state income taxes and FICA tax. Uh, that can be pretty simple, but uh, um, still a lot of people aren't aware of that. So that's a, that's a good, easy first step place to get started. The second, which is a little bit more complicated, is identifying all the areas where money is going out. Now, the basics, those fundamentals or the necessities we were talking about earlier, are easier to identify. You know, that's our, our house payment, what we pay for our utilities, groceries, uh, car payments, uh, putting gas in the car, things like that. The harder things and the, and the area where I think most people get in trouble are those kind of expenses that they're not tracking. Um, and that would be, you know, entertainment. Um, their, what, what they view as their discretionary money, which in reality may not be discretionary because it's money they actually don't have to spend. And so it's important to identify your fixed expenses, those expenses that you're gonna encounter every month so that you can, so that you recognize the amount of discretionary income you have and then make priorities with that discretionary income, uh, whether that priority is savings, or eliminating debt, something along those lines. So first question for everybody is, what does everybody think the average credit card balance is in the United States? Uh, 3,100, 4,400, 6,200, or 8,700? The answer is 6,200. However, the average American has four cards. So the total credit card debt is over $24,000 in the United States. And that's as of, uh, that's according to USA Today, which was reported on February 12, 2020. And I suspect for many of us, uh, that number has possibly gone up. I know some people have been able to eliminate some debt during uh, some of the COVID restrictions, but for a lot of people, that number has gone up. Uh, of course, not all debt is bad. I talked about this a little bit earlier. So examples of good debt are like buying a car to get to work or to obtain an education. Uh, 
Another example is buying a home. Uh, the first two are examples that allow you to accomplish financial goals. goals. For, most of a, for most of us, this car is essential to getting to jobs, to school. Uh, and buying a home is a great way to increase your wealth. Um, actually, there's two areas that buying a home can be beneficial. First off, it allows you to freeze your um, your uh, living expense or your the expense that you pay with uh, for your uh, shelter. Um, when you buy a home and fix that cost, your house payment, the principal and interest you pay, doesn't change over the life of that loan. Whereas if you're out if you're out there renting, and for those of us who have rented, we know that rents go up every year, uh, and sometimes they go up quite a bit. Uh, and so building a home can be a really good way to help you control an expense. And it's a really good way to build wealth because as uh, many of you may be aware who are keeping an eye on the housing market, uh, home values tend to only go up. Now, within that, you can still make bad decisions, right? When buying a car, you can spend too much for a car. You don't need a $50,000 car to get to school or get to work. So you have to make good decisions even when uh, incurring debt that can potentially be good for you or help you to reach goals. Um, some basic considerations, it's best not to accrue any high interest rate debt. That, that typically refers to credit card debt. Now, those high interest rates make it very, very difficult um, to eliminate the principal because so much of the payment is dedicated to just the interest that's accruing on the debt. It's also important to be mindful of how much debt you have compared to your income. One of the ratios that is used in the uh, financial services industry is a debt to income ratio. And this is your total debt or committed payments, whether it's a house payment, rent, credit card debt, car payments, et cetera. You take that number and you divide it by your gross income. And that tells you your debt to income ratio. Now, banks or other lending institutions are always looking for people with a debt, an interest to debt ratio of 36% or less. And of course, the lower that number, the better for you when it comes to uh, obtaining favorable terms from a lending institution. Banks or credit unions, car dealerships, they have different interest rates that they charge on loans. And the interest rate you get has a lot to do with your debt to income ratio. And in fact, it can determine whether you get a loan at all. It's always wise to tie debt to appreciating assets. Now, a home is a good example of that. Um, but most, I mean, if we're honest, most assets, for example, a car are, uh, or for that matter, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking what debt actually asset appreciates in value. And I think of a car or I mean a home rather. So the other thing you can do though, is recognizing that all assets tend to depreciate as you wanna look for assets that depreciate less than others. Not all cars depreciate at the same level. Uh, and if you're trying to uh, reduce depreciation, well, a good way to do that is buy a good used car versus a new car. Of course, you take a serious hit uh, on the value of that car, the minute you, a new car, the minute you drive it off the lot. Whereas if you buy a car that's uh, three to five years old, uh, it will have already absorbed the maximum uh, depreciation, uh, which is something that you as a purchaser can take advantage of. Now, of course, the ultimate goal is to pay yourself interest, not someone else. I just, uh, saw this saying the other day, it said, if you don't learn how to make money while you sleep, you'll work until you're dead. Uh, what they're talking about, paying yourself interest is saving money and investing that money, whether, whether you're putting it in a bank account, which I realize has just uh, really low interest rates, 
or whether you open some kind of a, an investment account uh, with a brokerage or uh, some of these online apps like Robinhood where you can invest money and actually get a little bit better rate of return. Uh, and the nice thing about interest is, is that the interest is accumulating even when you're asleep. It doesn't require you to work to, to receive it. A little bit more, one of the other fundamentals of uh, the uh, debt is trying to eliminate debt. Uh, there are a couple of ways you can do that. One is to round up payments. So if you, you have a payment that's say $175 a month, round that to $200. Uh, look at the current loans that you have outstanding and, and confirm that you're actually, you actually have good terms. Uh, what is the interest rate? What is the duration on that loan? Um, we live in a time now where interest rates are very favorable. Um, rates on mortgages are low. I know that they've taken a bit of a hit lately uh, and possibly could be taking another hit in the future as um, there may be efforts by the Fed to increase interest rates to slow down inflation. So you have to be aware of those things when you're making, especially like the purchase of a home. Um, I remember when I bought my first home or just before I bought my first home, mortgage rates on homes were anywhere from eight to 12%. Uh, now interest rates on mortgages are two to 4%. And if you ever jump on a, a mortgage calculator and run the numbers, the difference between the mortgage rates you're paying today and what we paid uh, 40 years ago are tremendous. Uh, and they allow you to have a lower payment and, and uh, afford a, a greater loan value. Uh, so, but if you're looking at those, especially a mortgage or even a car, uh, and you feel like you could get a lower rate, then it can, it's always beneficial to try to negotiate a lower rate or when necessary, refinance. Uh, we touched on this a little bit. It's important that you pay your bills on time. Of course, that's, you want to establish a good credit history. We talked about uh, your debt to income ratio. Uh, that's important to lenders. The other thing is your credit score. It's really important that you pay your bills on time. It's also important that you avoid late charges, penalties, and fees, because not only do, does paying late hurt you in terms of your credit score, but it also is money that you're paying that doesn't reduce the debt. Uh, and so you want to avoid, you're not getting anything by paying late charges, penalties, or fees. In fact, it's only a negative. Now, there are a couple of strategies uh, that are recommended for reducing debt. One is called avalanche, one is snowball. Uh, we're gonna talk about those in more detail in the next slide. And then the last is when debt is paid, don't get back into debt. I remember when home equity loans first came in uh, into favor. A lot of people who had amassed a lot of high interest rate credit card debt would take out a, uh, a second mortgage on their home, which was a lower interest rate to pay off that debt. And maybe in some cases that was a good idea. The problem was is that once they had shifted those uh, high interest rate debts to a lower interest rate second mortgage, they immediately went out and charged up the credit cards again. So they actually made their position worse by doing the loan consolidation. So it's, imp it's important that once you get out of debt, stay out of debt. Now, one of the methods to reducing existing debt is the debt avalanche method. In the debt avalanche method, you organize um, your outstanding debt in terms of the highest interest rate. So you can see in this example, credit card number one has an interest rate of 22%, credit card number two, 17%, and then on down until we get to the mortgage at 3%. You can see in that first row of numbers, that's the current payment 
that the individual is making on each of those loans. In the avalanche method, the individual would take any extra money they had and commit that to the first credit card until that debt was paid off. Then once that debt would, was paid off, they would take the amount that they were paying on credit card number one and add it to the amount that they're paying on credit card number two and do that until credit card number two is paid off. And then once credit card number two is paid off, take the amount that the cumulative amount that they were paying on credit card number two and add that to the amount that they were paying on uh, the car loan until they paid that. And they would continue to do that until they elim had eliminated all of the debt. You'll notice that it doesn't, it's not gonna reduce your monthly outlay um, your monthly outlay is going to remain constant throughout. The idea is, is that by paying off the debts earlier, shortening the duration of the loan, uh, you get out of debt faster and you pay much less in, in interest rate payments. The next method, and this seems to be the method that people find more uh, satisfactory, is called the debt snowball method. Now, in this method, you don't look at the interest rate, rather you look at the balance and you start with the, the card with the lowest balance first. So you see in this case, even though credit card number one has the highest interest rate, it has the lower, the lower balance. And so the idea is the same as in the avalanche method, you start out dedicated to paying off that balance on credit card number one, because it's a lower balance, you're able to accomplish it quicker. And then you take that payment, combine it with the payment you've been making on credit card number two until you have that paid off. And then continue in that manner until eventually uh, you've eliminated all your debt. Again, you're not reducing your monthly outlay until all the debt is paid off, but just like with the avalanche method, you're, sh you're sh paying off the debt quicker, which reduces the amount of um, interest that you pay over the life of the loan. People find, I think people find this a little bit more satisfying because you're starting with something that uh, a, a debt that has a lower balance. And so you can see progress occurring quicker than say in the avalanche method. All right, let's shift gears. Let's now talk about savings. Uh, question, what percentage of Americans would be able to cover an $1,000 emergency with savings? The answer, 41%. Uh, this study showed that actually only 30, that, excuse me, not only, but 30% of Americans said they would use a credit card take out a personal loan or ask family for a financial help to handle an unexpected expense. Um, of course, what happens is if you don't have that emergency savings to fall back, then you're forced to take the next thing that's available, which is a high interest rate credit card debt, which only exacerbates uh, the problem that you're dealing with. Uh, and so let's talk about emergency savings. First off, emergency savings is defined as three to six months of income. This money should be safe and accessible. Another way of re referring to accessible is liquidity. You wanna be able to access this money quickly. What does that mean? Well, that means you're probably gonna have it in a savings account with a bank or credit union. Yes, you're gonna get a terrible rate of return uh, on the interest that you earn on the plan, but you're willing to trade that off because you can access that money almost immediately. Uh, whether it's driving to a, a handy bank or a, an ATM and, and putting in your card and accessing the money if you need it, or driving to the, uh, the bank or credit union and, and withdrawing that money. That money is immediately available so that whether it's a car repair, a home repair, or something more serious like loss of job, that money is immediately available when you need it. Now, everybody's initial goal should be at least $1,000, but that's not where you, you're going to stop. You're going to try to get that 
your minimum is a thousand dollars and you, then you build it from there until you reach the three to six months of income. And then this isn't money that you should keep mingled with your checking account or with your uh, vacation account or what other what other savings accounts you have. This should be an account in an account that is designated just for emergencies. That way you don't touch it unless you have an emergency. Having it separated will help you to develop the discipline to keep you from touching it uh, or losing track of it if you commingle it with other accounts. Uh, one other thing with emergency savings, um, one of the things we've learned in this process is that sometimes people will focus on the emergency savings and ex uh, but neglect their debt. Um, I've met with a few people over the last couple of years who will have, um, you know, high interest rate debt, um, but then they'll have say $15,000 sitting in their emergency savings. Um, the idea would be that it doesn't make sense to pay high interest rate and credit card debt and maintain emergency savings over $1,000. So if you find yourself in that position, unless there's a really compelling reason to have that uh, extra money in emergency savings, you are much better off to pay off the high uh, interest rate uh, debt, uh, for example, like a credit card. And then once that's paid off, then take the money that you were using to pay off that interest, the high interest rate debt, and then commit it to building your emergency savings. Um, so when you're doing this, it's important that you're accountable to yourself, all right? And that you actually take stock of where you're at. So how do you feel about your financial wellness today? Do you feel that you're doing well? Do you feel that you have areas that need improvement? Regardless of where you are today, are you taking steps to improve your position? One of the things that you can do that can help you is to take advantage of one of our free uh, financial wellness sessions. Uh, during a, the free financial wellness session, You'll spend one hour with one of our financial advisors. Again, we do these in person or virtually. Uh, you sign up online and I'll show you how to do that in a minute. But during this financial wellness session, we'll look at those three areas. We'll look at your spending plan, we'll look at your debt, and then we'll look at uh, savings. Um, as part of this service, you're required to enter your financial information. Uh, we're gonna need to know how much money's coming in, how much is gross, what is your net, and then you're gonna have to go through and itemize um, your spending. This is an important step that you can't skip. This is where you start to get a handle or become aware of your financial situation. Uh, plus, we need that information if we're to advise you. We also have a lot of other topics that we're prepared to address with you. And we have a lot of information that we've compiled over the last two years that based on your individual situation, we can provide you with uh, handouts with additional information on topics that are uh, interesting to you or specific to your situation. So this is how you're gonna do it. You're gonna log into your account at urs.org. I hope everybody has done that. If you haven't, you need to go to urs.org and create a username and password. In order to do that, you're gonna need some information. Uh, you'll need your date of birth and the last four of your social security number. All of you should know that. But you're also gonna need to know your URS member number. Now, everybody's URS member st number starts with the letter W. If you don't have your URS member number, you can call the URS customer service department and they can provide you with that information. Once you've logged in, you're gonna click on the education tab, which is located at the top right-hand side of the page. And then 
once you click there, you'll see this list of links that you can see on the left hand side. Um, one of the services that we offer is an individual retirement planning session. In this session, we focus just on your retirement. We look at your URS retirement benefits. If you have a pension, we'll look at Social Security and we'll look at your individual retirement savings um, and your investment options. And that's that's really important because that's got to be part of your planning for retirement has got to be part of your overall financial planning. The second service, the one that we've been talking about today is um, the uh, individual financial wellness sessions. Now, when you click on these links, the first thing you're gonna see is it's gonna pull up a schedule of dates, locations, and times that are available, and you can sign up for in-person or virtual sessions. Now, when you can, when you sign up for these, it's important that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you need to complete this financial wellness profile as part of the uh, financial wellness sessions. And then you need to complete this investor profile as part of the individual retirement planning session. And you'll be prompted to complete those. And that, that's information that we uh, need in order to uh, provide you with advice. That's so uh, the needed information, this is the stuff that you're gonna have to pull together before you sit down and schedule this uh, session, uh, the financial wellness session. Of course, you're gonna need to know your monthly income, you're gonna need your monthly expenses, your debts, and then what you're doing in terms of savings. You're gonna need all of that information to fill out that profile uh, that we need in order to provide you with advice. Now, for those of you who like to use uh, calculators, we have a link to financial wellness calculators. You can see that we have calculators uh, dedicated to debt management, um, insurance calculators. One of the things that is ignored, especially among younger folks, is life insurance. This insurance calculator will help you to determine how much uh, life insurance you should be carrying. We also have individual calculators uh, for mortgages, uh, and then we have personal finance calculators that deal with a lot of other issues. And if you click on those various links, it'll pull up all of the calculators that you can use. Among those debt management calculators are the calculators that uh, uh, utilize the debt or, or excuse me, the snowball or, or the avalanche method to eliminate uh, personal debt. So these are the services or educational uh, services that are available to you to, through Utah retirement systems. And this is all free to URS members. Of course, as we discussed, we have the retirement planning and financial wellness sessions that you can sign up for. We have uh, many pre-recorded webinars and we also provide live webinars every month on various uh, retirement and financial wellness topics. Uh, your employers can schedule presentations where we'll come out and do presentations on the various URS retirement benefits and financial wellness. Uh, there are a lot of good videos available in addition to the webinars. These are things that have, you know, been recorded and set aside so that they can be viewed uh, when it's convenient for you. Our website is an excellent source to learn about uh, these topics, whether it's financial wellness or whether it's your URS retirement benefits. Uh, we have all sorts of links to different things that, and, and online calculators that you can use. Uh, to evaluate your situation and learn more. And then, of course, there's a lot of printed publications available. Our goal at Utah Retirement Systems is to help you to achieve financial freedom, whether that's today or whether it's in retirement. Um, we're going to help you to get your financial goals in line with your personal values. Um, it's been interesting as we've done these sessions to see how people, how people's priorities are different. 
uh, and how people's and how their priorities affect their spending. Um, it's not our job or our concern to tell somebody that their that their values are incorrect or their priorities are incorrect because one person might value something more than another. Uh, for some people, uh, entertainment's more expensive than something else, whether it's a vacation or you know, a nicer car. The whole idea behind this is to put you in control of your finances rather than having your finances control you. It's when your finances control you that you feel the stress uh, and the anxiety and the depression that comes with that. Of course, you want to be able to weather any financial emergency and you want to have the ability to choose how you spend your money rather than having your debts dictate how your money is spent. That's all of my presentation. I hope that was uh, helpful to everybody. I don't know if there are any questions. I'd be more than the happy, uh, more than happy to answer any questions now. Excellent. Um, our first question we have is, what are your thoughts on paying your house or car payment more frequently than monthly? Absolutely. I mean, that's a strategy similar to uh, rounding up payments, right? Um, especially uh, one of the strategies is rather than making the payment, uh, making the payment every two weeks, right? Divide the monthly payment in half, but make that payment every two weeks. You're making additional monthly payment every year that way. Um, and I, I've seen studies that show how that, especially on a, a, a loan, like a mortgage loan that has a long duration, how that can significant, significantly shorten the payoff period, which significantly reduces the amount of debt that you pay. And the next question's um, kind of similar. This one says, is it wise to pay more on your mortgage every month or invest extra money? Good question. Um, it's, it's really about interest rates, right? Uh, of course, your first objective is you've got to make sure that uh, you've eliminated all of that bad debt, right? And then the question is, once I've eliminated all of my bad debt, and I have the emergency savings that I need, should I continue to reduce debt, like a mortgage, which typically has a lower interest rate, or am I better off to invest that money? Well, sometimes it's a matter of what is the interest rate? If you can average a 7% a rate of return on an investment, but you're only paying 3% on your mortgage, you might be better off uh, to pay investments. Of course, one of the things that's really hard to uh, evaluate in that is of course, that mortgage payments are annuitized, which means that payments made at first, more of the money you pay goes to paying the interest that's accruing on the loan and less to reducing debt. And it's hard to evaluate that. So. I suppose what I would do if it was me in my own life, I would make sure that I had uh, my bad debt addressed. Uh, if that's anything where I'm paying, you know, a higher interest rate, I would want to make sure that I had a, an emergency savings that I was comfortable with, that I was saving for retirement, and that I was going to meet all of my retirement goals. And then I'd have to evaluate the individual situation on whether you should be investing more money, like in a brokerage account versus paying off that home loan. It's really a kind of a matter of priorities. Thank you, Tracy. We have a couple more questions. The next one is what percentage of current income do you recommend having available for retirement? Well, you're, you're never going to base it on your current income. You're always going to base it on your future income. Now, some of the some of the basic or kind of fundamentals that are talked about is that you should have 10 to 12 times your income at retirement in savings when you retire. So 
If you anticipate that at retirement, you may be making $100,000 a year and you would like to maintain that lifestyle, then you're gonna to need to have a million to 1.2 million saved in order to make that possible. And that, in, and, and that takes into consideration that you're receiving social security. One of the things that we can help you with in those individual retirement planning sessions is we can take what you're currently paying Project uh, based on what you feel your salary will uh, increase annually, give you an idea of what your income will be in the future, and then help you to develop a plan so that between your pension, social security and retirement savings plans, you're able to replace that income. Uh, one of the other things you can look at is having, uh, it's generally recommended that you're able to replace it at least 80% of your income in retirement in an order to maintain your lifestyle. But of course, that assumes that you've, uh, you have uh, less debt going into retirement. Okay, the next one is, what's your opinion on saving for retirement in a 401k versus an IRA? And I guess you're asking about a Roth IRA. Um, uh, a 401k, now at Utah Retirement Systems, we have four retirement plans. Three of them are tax deferred, the 401k, 457, and traditional IRA. And then the, the sole after-tax plan is the Roth IRA. Whether you save to a tax deferred plan or an after-tax plan depends on a number of factors. For example, your age, uh, your income level, your and your tax liability. Generally, the goal is you want to pay as little in taxes as possible. So for those who, who are in higher income tax brackets, we would generally recommend a tax deferred plan. Because with a tax deferred plan, you don't pay the taxes while your income is high, but you pay the taxes later when in theory, your income taxes will, or when your income and, and taxes would be lower. The opposite uh, would be the case if, for example, you, uh, with your income after subtracting all your uh, deductions and uh, when you file your income taxes, if you had a low tax liability, um, then a Roth IRA makes sense. Now, I happen to be, especially for younger folks, a big fan of Roth IRAs for a couple of reasons. First, your income's generally lower and you generally have more deductions. Now, the value of deductions has kind of gone away uh, in the last two or three years because um, several years ago, Congress and Senate, or Congress passed a bill that created a standard deduction. So a lot of us who are itemizing deductions in the past based on charitable contributions, uh, interest rate payments on a mortgage, um, that's no longer valuable. Uh, in fact, uh, my, the standard deduction that you're able to take is generally, well, depending on your situation is much greater than uh, itemizing deductions. But having said that, if, you're de if after your deductions, you're paying a low, uh, federal income tax rate, then the Roth is a great tool because with the Roth, even though you pay taxes on those contributions today, all of the money that grows in that account over your lifetime of contributions is going to be tax free. So imagine if you got started early and you started saving in a Roth IRA. Yeah, you're going to be paying taxes on those contributions. But the growth that you see in that account, especially if you're young, will dwarf the contributions and all of that growth will be tax free. So I really like Roth IRAs. Thank you. We have more coming in if you have time to answer. Okay. Yeah, let's go. I'm good. All right. We have what is the new income ratio to pay on housing costs? Oh, I don't know that off the top of my head. Um, let me see. I know, I know what it is. Give me just a second here. It's one of the things that we look at when we, uh, when we meet with you. 
Um, I, you know what? I'm sorry. I'm not sure where. Uh, I'm not sure where to pull that information off the top of my head. Um, imagine a good Google search would would tell us. Let's see what Google says. If all else fails, go to Google, right? <laughs> So Google says uh, home to income ratio. By the way, that's one of the things that we look at when we look at your spending plan is whether your spending plan is in line with like national averages. Um, of course, you know, everybody's situation is different, right? A single person versus a family of four is going to have a lot. Uh, different uh, different expenses, and so while that uh, debt to income ratio is of thirty six percent is standard regardless of your situation, uh, there are ranges that are recommended for the uh, the individual expenses, and we do discuss that now. This site, which is uh, Chase Bank, is saying that uh, you should spend 28% or less of your monthly gross income on your mortgage. And that include, includes principal interest taxes and insurance. Hopefully that helps. And we have another mortgage question. This one says mortgage payments are much cheaper than rent. Why is that? Does a co-signer on a mortgage help with obtaining a mortgage? What if I only qualify for 150k mortgage? Is there realistically any places in the metro area that someone normal can afford? <laughs> That's a loaded question. Yeah, yeah, and one that I can't answer. You'd have to talk to a realtor on that. But I, I do understand uh, the frustration there. And yeah, you're right. Um, I mean, I have uh, four children. They're all adults. Two have purchased uh, townhomes and two are still renting. Those that are renting would love to be able to buy. The problem is, is finding something in your price range and then saving money uh, so that you can uh, meet the down payment requirement. Um, this is really something that you have to get with the realtor for to determine what the market is and then what, uh, what lenders are going to require in terms of down payments but yeah it's it's a challenge i remember I, I i hate to tell you this but um let's see it would have been 35 years ago when we bought our first home we paid fifty six thousand dollars. but i'm going to tell you we didn't know and and our mortgage payment was only four hundred dollars a month but I'll tell you, I didn't know how we were going to make that payment. And I know that seems kind of crazy compared to what uh, rent payments and, and values of homes are today. Uh, but for, I mean, I believe at that time, my wife and I were both making about $5 an hour. And so a $400 payment was difficult. But sorry, I have to kind of punt on that one. That's more of a realtor question. All right, no problem. This one says, what tools on URS can help someone track their money better? Do you have any you know, sort of budget? Yeah, we don't, we don't. Other than that initial profile that you're gonna fill out. Um, let me look, I don't think, I'm gonna look at our online calculators, um, that link. I don't think um, there's a, a, a budgeting I know we have like a, a, a handout that people can use, but I want to look at the financial wellness calculators. I know my second son, who's really big into financial wellness and budgeting, he uses an online uh, budgeting app that uh, he really, really likes. Um, I don't remember the top of it off the top of my head, but I'm sure if you go online, Oh, so here, so I'm just looking at the personal financial calculators. Let me uh, see if I can share this with you. Are you able to see that, Sadie? No, we still see your presentation. Okay, let me uh, let me reshare this if I know how to. I'm not sure I know how to. Well, let me just describe it to you. So, 
anyway, I clicked on those financial wellness calculators links and then the personal finance calculators. And just to give you an idea, we have a home budget analysis calculator. This is a way to analyze your budget and see where your money goes and find out where you can improve. Uh, we've got a, uh, let's see, in, inflation and consumer prices calculator, but no, it doesn't look like we have anything that helps you with your budgeting. Um, so you're going to have to maybe, hopefully that's something that maybe we can add in the future, but right now that's not a tool that we have. And there are a lot of free apps out there that you can use. Okay, next question. Do you know if the five years an employee can buy after 25 years, can the five years be purchased with the URS account money? Yes. Yes, you can use, uh, recommended you use your tax deferred money, whether it's in your 401k or 50, 457 or traditional IRA. This one you asks also, about, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, you can also use, if you have outside savings, an IRA and a brokerage or something, or a 401k with a for, former employer, you can use those funds as well. Excellent. All right. Are there drawbacks to rolling over 401k funds into tax deferred Roth accounts besides the upfront tax expense? Is it an easy process to accomplish? Well, first off, you have to be you have to be eligible to make the withdrawal from the 401k. Second off, uh, there's a limit to how much you can. I think it's currently you can convert up to $100,000 a year. But like you've noted, when you do that conversion, a conversion is actually treated as a withdrawal from the tax deferred plan, which triggers uh, a taxable event. Uh, if you uh, if you use money from the uh, from the 401k or other tax deferred plan to pay those taxes, that's going to count as uh, and if you're under age 59 and a half, that's going to count as an, an early withdrawal and would also be subject to a 10% penalty. So our recommendation is to always be prepared to pay the taxes on the conversion out of outside money not involved in the conversion, but otherwise no fees, just forms that you have to fill out. You can contact our savings plan department and they can help you with that. This next one asks about 401k as well. It says, I am enrolled in the tier two 401k option. Currently I have 100% going into small cap, 40 years old. At what age should I adjust that to different funds and what funds do you recommend? We actually uh, don't recommend a single fund ever. Uh, we actually recommend the target date funds because they're a profile or a portfolio of investments. Um, it's important, regardless of your age, it's important to have diversification. For example, right now, um, uh, the growth funds are getting hit. Uh, I think. So far this year, growth, our large cap growth fund is down 5%. Over the last decade, that fund has performed very well. Conversely, uh, the value fund, which has been down a little bit compared to the growth fund is actually, I think up about 5%. Uh, small cap fund, which has been performing well is also down this year. So we actually recommend the target date fund. The target date fund is a mix of the index large cap index, the small cap and the international fund. It also uses some private real estate investments. And then depending on your age, uh, income and bond funds. And of course the advantage to that target date fund is that as you get older, the portfolio mix changes, uh, becoming more conservative as you approach retirement. Thank you, Tracy. Um, this person said, you mentioned free apps. I get the feeling when I explore online that the free calculators are seeking personal information. What are your thoughts? Well, I've never used one to be honest with you, and I'm sure they are because they're going to have to, I mean, I guess I don't know what kind, I mean, if they're asking for your social security number or a credit card number, I don't want to give them that. But if they're asking, I mean, as part of the app, they're going to have to, you know, know your 
financial situation so that they can, you know, so that you can use the app. Um, I'm not sure what other personal information they might be asking for. But I understand you being cautious about that. This person added um, not a social security number, but savings amounts, but it seems like they would need to know that. Yep, they're going to need to know that. Okay. All right, and this one asks, is it really worth the money to buy your years in the pension versus retiring with less than 30 years? It depends. It depends on if you're looking at an early age reduction when you retire and the amount of the early age reduction. And then of course the cost to purchase. That's one of the things that we address in the individual retirement planning session. We can do a, a break even analysis for you, determining if it's to your advantage or disadvantage to buy years of service. Well, Tracy, thank you very much. That was the end of those questions and we threw a lot at you. So I appreciate you answering each of them. You bet. Happy to, happy to help or hope I help. Yes, and we have some thank yous in the chat box as well and some awesome presentation comments. Uh, well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And if you did not sign in, I put the sign in in the chat box for you so that you can get Earn points for participating today, but we hope you have a happy Thursday and thank you so much, Tracy, for being You're here. Welcome. You're very welcome. And I will stick around until one o'clock if anyone has any last minute questions.